also working at at uh, Vias Institute, the, the Belgian National Road Safety Institute in, uh, in Brussels. And um, I will be your host today together with some colleagues of the steering committee. A very special welcome to our speaker of today, Dr. Ezra Hauer, uh, currently at uh, Toronto in Canada. So good morning, Mr. Hauer. Morning. Uh, we are very glad uh, to, to have you with us uh, today. Uh, Dr. Hauer is, uh, and most uh, attendants will know, that is one of the world's uh, most respected uh, road safety scientists and probably uh, many of the people that uh, are attending the session today already have used his work and have read his work. So we are very glad to have you with us. Before we start the, the session, we want to ask your kind collaboration to take part in a very small poll survey that will uh, normally appear on your screen more or less right now. Just uh, two questions, uh, just to reassure you, it's just uh, something that we will use right now. We don't keep your data. Um, so please uh, <coughs> fill it out and you will immediately see the result of your, what you fill out. Meanwhile, I will continue with uh, just a few words about ICTCT. ICTCT stands for International uh, <coughs> Cooperation on Theories and Concepts in Road Safety. It is an international association already uh, around since uh, 1988. And our aim is to build up and to share knowledge on road safety. Uh, we do it, for instance, by organizing one annual conference uh, uh, every year. And uh, every now and then the conferences are usually held in, in, in Europe, always in different countries. But uh, since a number of years, we already uh, we are already are started with um, every uh, two year with conferences, extra conferences outside uh, Europe as well. In fact, in all parts of uh, the world, we kindly invite you to uh, discover ICTCT on our website, and also there you can sign up for <coughs> updates uh, on our activities. The next conference, uh, just a few words on that, will be held uh, next year in Berlin, Germany. It was originally planned to be held uh, this year, but for obvious reasons, it was postponed. People who already submitted an abstract, they were informed that accepted abstracts will be retained for the next edition. But uh, for the ones who were not yet aware of the conference, we will open a second call for abstracts in uh, early spring next year. The deadline will be somewhere in May 21, and the conference will go on in October, October 28 and 29th, 21. So most welcome also on behalf of our local partner, the German um, Aerospace uh, Institute, DLR, who will be the local host for the conference. <clears throat> we can see now the results of the polls. So it appears that of the people present in the webinar, most are uh, based in Europe and the, the group with the academic background is uh, clearly the best represented. So that's just for your information. Um, let's continue, let's move on to the webinar. Um, what we concretely plan to do is we will have a, a lecture of around uh, 35 minutes. Afterwards, there will be room for questions and uh, obviously also answers from Mr. Hauer. Uh, what we would like to apply as a procedure is that you use, if you have questions, you use the button in Zoom 
somewhere down below, it should be in the middle. Uh, you uh, click on that, you ask your question, and the question session will be moderated by Alexei Lorishin from Lund University, who will group uh, the answers and uh, um, brief them to Dr. Hauer in order to, to structure our Q&A session in the best way possible. This also means that uh, if you already have questions during the lecture, don't hesitate to, to ask them already uh, by that uh, Zoom platform. And that makes it easier to have uh, a very uh, good and active Q&A session after the, the webinar. So we will uh, end the webinar around uh, four o'clock. So let's move on to that part. Uh, just one final remark before we start. We will uh, record the full webinar and make it available on the ICTCT website. So you can find back this recording afterwards as well. I wish you a very nice uh, session and it's the moment now to uh, give the floor to Dr. Hauer. Please, uh, Dr. Hauer, the floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, somehow we have to switch to my presentation from your presentation. Okay. Now I have to somehow try and get to, to put yours to the side. Okay. So <clears throat> thank you for your, for your introduction, Stain. Uh, it's a bit of a homecoming for me. I, I used to be a member of ICTCT when the three last letters still stood for traffic conflicts technique instead of theories. Uh, um, so it's really great to be back. Uh, although somehow sentimentally, I should say, it's about a generation or more than has, than has passed since I was a member of ICTCT. We are speaking about <coughs> crash causation and prevention. In the first slide you see, I, I plastered it with uh, first pages of several reports. Every Sorry, Ezra, we don't see your slides. Oh, I don't see it. How? Well, uh, I can try. How about Stain? Do you see the slides? Because it worked before. No, I don't see them. You, you have not started sharing. Well, I... Yeah, it's the same from audience. They don't see slides. Yeah, okay. How about now? Still the same. How about now? No, no not yet. Not yet. Well, uh, I think I returned to meeting. Now I see yep, an slide. I am screen sharing. Yes, we see your screen now, but not the slides. How about now? Now we it see the closer. slides okay. with the presenter notes. And now the current slide. Okay, let's do it this way. Everything okay? That's yeah. good. All right, so we are speaking about crash causation studies and by crash causation study, 
I mean, a study conducted by a team of experts conducting a great deal of detail about hundreds and often thousands of crashes. And the purpose of uh, <clears throat> this uh, huge data collection is always the hope that we, once we understand crash occurrence better, uh, then we will be better at preventing crashes. <clears throat> All these studies, without exception, find and all these studies spend a long period of time. I have looked at studies from 1975 till 2019. They all find surprisingly similar results. The result usually or on the average is that 65% of all crashes have the road user as the sole only cause and that almost all crashes, about 95, 97%, have the road user as a cause. And the little graphic that you see on the left is an old graphic, it was done by Kore Rumar, if not, I'm not mistaken. And it summarizes the earliest two studies. So you see, for example, that in one of these, the road user was the sole cause in 65% of the crashes. In the other study, the road user was the sole cause in 57% of the crashes. The road environment was the only cause in two or 3%. The vehicle in two or 2%. The road user and the road and environment in 24 and 27. So you see the structure of this, uh, this little graph. Now, while these are the two oldest studies, all other studies came up with very similar results, which I'm sure you'll find very surprising in road safety. Usually we get very divergent results. But if this is so, if if the road user is really the only cause in two thirds of the, of the accidents and the cause in 95% of them, then one might perhaps be excused for thinking that prevention ought to be oriented towards the road user. And I ask, is that so? Is it really true? that 65% of the crashes have no other cause than the road user. And uh, I'm afraid that my answer will be no, that is not so. And it is an unpleasant answer to give because it goes against generations of research, costly research done by eminent researchers and who I am to question all of them. And I shared my, shared my trepidation with my granddaughter who is a veterinarian. And he, she told, told me, you know, grandfather put up a picture of a puppy or a kitten that will soften the audience. So here you have a self portrait here. You are getting lectured by an old dog who spent most of his time in academia. So now let me try to answer the is that so question. And I will do that by asking the two questions below. What are the causes of crashes? And how is one to link crash cause to crash prevention. So what is cause? We all personally have a concept of cause, but philosophers dealt with this question from the time of Plato 
and it has been a subject of continuous controversy. So philosophers still not agree on a definition of cause. But then there is an entirely different kind of cause, a cause that serves a purpose. And here I listed, and you can find on the internet, many more concepts of instrumental cause, causes for a purpose. Cause in fact, but for cause, proximate cause, ultimate cause, and so on. The list goes on and on. And each of these instrumental causes has its own definition. And it's very, very difficult to find common strands. They are all slightly different. It's like this Gordic knot that you never see the core of it. It turns out that it's probably impossible to, to write down a definition of cause which serves a purpose when the purposes are so different. So let's accept it and try to do it for our purpose. Our purpose is crash prevention. And so the question is, what is to be crash cause when our purpose is to prevent crashes? And here I need to clarify. <clears throat> By crash prevention, I mean those actions that are intended to reduce the probability of future crashes or their severity. And I believe that this is an entirely uncontroversial statement. So I hope that we all agree on this meaning of crash prevention. So having clarified crash prevention, back to the main question, what is crash cause when prevention is the purpose? And to get to the core of this Gordian knot of varying definitions, I will pick up a loose strand and pull on it and see whether by pulling on it, I come to the, to the useful core. And this, First, our st strength for me is the questioning of the statement that the road user is the sole cause in 65% of crashes. And throughout this uh, presentation, <coughs> I will use a real example. The real example is a bit painful because it reels with the pain of real people. Two years ago, the Humboldt Broncos hockey team, a junior hockey team, was traveling on this road, number 35 in Saskatchewan. I don't remember whether they were going to a hockey game or returning from a hockey game. At the intersection, which is marked by the red arrow, it's called the Armley Corner, suddenly, a tractor trailer emerged at the time when the bus driver was very close to the intersection. The crash reconstruction shows that he started breaking 24 meters before the intersection, but of course could not stop because the speed limit on both roads is 100 kilometers per hour. The tractor trailer was supposed to stop. There is a stop sign with a flashing beacon on his uh, approach to the intersection. It did not stop, entered the intersection at full speed. 
16 young boys lost their lives. Visibility was good. No problem with the vehicles. No alcohol in any of the drivers. None of them. None was exceeding the speed limit. As you can imagine, this put the entire nation into shock. Uh, for weeks, there was TV coverage, there were memorials, church services, tributes, support, services in churches, mosques, synagogues. There was a cloud over the country and, and sadness in everybody's heart. What happened after? <clears throat> well, of course, there was the trial. You could think of it as a prevention action, although, I mean, other than some vague, the, general deterrence, there was nothing there. The Saskatchewan Ministry of Highways and Infrastructure asked for an engineering report about Armley Corner. Are there any deficiencies that it should be corrected? The only <clears throat> large scale response was that all provincial ministers of transport got together with the federal minister of transport and decided that they will introduce a mandatory entry level training, MELT, mandatory entry level training for all novice truck drivers. Of course, every driver without any entry level training knows that it is, they put their lives in peril if they enter an intersection without stopping. So I can see how training would help that. But anyway, that was the only action. Surprisingly for me. There was the trial. And the verdict was, and I'm coming back to the question of course, the verdict was that it was the action of Mr. Sidhu, the truck driver, that caused the collision. And it was an agreed statement of fact within the trial. The prosecution, the, the defense, and the judge all agreed that this is the case. Okay, but there were these trees in one corner of the intersection, as you can see in the top, top right corner. And the truck driver could not see the approaching bus, and the bus driver could not see the approaching truck. So were these not a cause? Well, the legal system said no, and they said no, not only explicitly, but at great lengths, they explained why the trees were not a cause in this accident. The reasoning was basically that uh, had the, the truck driver stopped at the stop sign, he would have seen the bus. But at a deeper level, they said no, because this is inherent in the legal system. The purpose of the trial and the trial proceedings was to establish guilt or innocence and liability. And for that purpose in law, the but for test is used. And I will explain. The test is, or says, 
that the defendant's action is cause if but for that action, the harm would not have occurred. That is the but for legal test. Because it is, there are sometimes more than one but for condition that is usually substitute, supplanted or substituted, added to by another condition called the proximate cause. And I will expand on it later. But for the time being, let's concentrate on the but for part of the test. Translating the but for test into crashes, a circumstance or an action is a crash cause if but for it, but for the circumstance or action, the crash would not have occurred. So why then did the legal system say that the trees were not a cause? because Mr. Sidhu's actions passed the but for test. Had he not entered the intersection without stopping, that accident, that crash would not have happened. But the same cannot be said about the trees in the corner. Had the trees not been there, the crash might well have happened. So the trees in the corner are not a but or cause. Of course, there's nothing wrong with the legal system. Their purpose is different. Their task is not prevention. And our purpose is not the determination of guilt and liability. And using their test, the but for test, for our purpose, for prevention, leads to a problem. And I'll tell you what the problem is. Research shows that crashes are fewer when insufficient intersection side distances are improved. When I say research shows, I mean there are empirical studies showing that. But the but for test says that insufficient size distance is not a crash cause. So we end up with a contradiction that there is an effect improving safety and it has no cause. That is intolerable. If you think about the first law of Isaac Newton, it says that an object will stay at rest unless there is a cause changing it. And if we continue traveling at a certain speed, unless there is a cause changing it. All our lives are arranged around the relationship between effect and cause. All our activities are arranged around this relationship. So to separate or to claim that there is an effect and no cause is perhaps a good tool in law, but not a good tool in life. <clears throat> Unfortunately, all the causation studies that I showed the first pages of uh, in the first slide, and all the causation studies that I have reviewed in the paper on the basis of which I am giving this presentation, all use the but for test to determine, to define cause. I don't want you to read all the words in this slide. It's just here to give you an impression that uh, I'm not inventing things. I'm actually quoting from every one of these studies. So if you look at the 1975-216, the first, first paper by Barbara Sabian and Stoughton uh, done in 
1975, I think it probably started 73, uh, says that we are listing, they are considering these factors without which the accident would not have happened. And the same is true for the TRL study dated 2016 using the same, uh, same uh, methodology. And the same is true for the North American studies at the bottom. FMCSA stands for Federal Motor, Ca Federal Motor Carrier Safety Administration. NHTSA, you will know, National Highway Traffic Safety Administration. <clears throat> they do not say, do not use the but for test explicitly but it's embedded in their notion of critical event and critical reason. Now we want to illustrate the problem in tangible ways. The but for test cuts the link between cause and prevention. Here you have a few quotes, you see the quotation marks. <coughs> they are from the, the I think, two, 2006 report uh, of crash causation studies for tracks US, the, what I earlier called uh, the MCSA study, yes, 2006, where they try to explain the notions of critical event and critical, critical reason. And they do the explanation by an example. <clears throat> so the story they tell of a crash is that on a four lane divided road, an SUV turns left at a stoplight or traffic signal, and it is hit in the intersection by a wrecker, you know, one of these tow truck cars, the wrecker which is unable to avoid the crash. And so they explain in this particular crash, the critical reason is failed to look or looked but did not see. And you must know that in this this particular exam in uh, crash causation study, they listed hundreds of factors surrounding every single one of these crashes. And when they looked through the factors for this particular story, there were no vehicle factors, so vehicles were okay, and no environmental factors. So the only cause, the single cause, was <clears throat> that the driver failed to look or did not see the oncoming vehicle about to crash into it. Now, what, what, what countermeasure does this critical reason indicate? Well, I cannot really think of any sensible thing to do but the obvious countermeasure is to change the signalization. Most of you are from Europe and it's perhaps unfamiliar to you that in North America, you are allowed to turn left when the green ball is displayed, displayed if there is no opposing traffic, it's called this permissive signalization. And the obvious remedy is to use instead a green arrow, the so-called protected left turn, where you are given your separate phase, nobody else is allowed to enter the intersection, only the left turning vehicle when the green arrow is displayed. Now, this particular crash and this specific signalization change 
is the most sensible, easiest, effective countermeasure in this case. However, the detailed investigation and the use of the but for or the, or the critical reason definition of cause fails to link cause to prevention. And this is a systemic bias inherent in the but for test, but for test used in all these crash causation studies. There's almost no circumstance or action that is present at the site minutes before the crash that can pass the but for test, just as the presence of the trees could not pass the but for test. And conversely, what the road user did or failed to do seconds before the crash will almost always pass the but for test. So I could be sitting at home in my armchair, not go out and see any crash and conclude without any investigation that almost all crashes are caused by road users. I'm not sure that I could come up with the 65% being a sole cause, <clears throat> but basically, these two numbers, the 65 and the 95, are a straight consequence of defining crash cause by the but for test. It is not a finding, it is a consequence of a definition that has been unfortunately used by all crash causation studies. <clears throat> So <clears throat> this but for definition is the source of all evil in crash prevention. And Marcus Aurelius realized that much already 2000 years ago, nearly 2000 years ago. And the problem is that if you define <clears throat> crash caused by the but for test, and conclude that in most cases, there is a single cause, the, the driver, the, the road user, then you don't really have a useful tool leading you from cause to prevention action. <clears throat> I have an alternative definition of crash cause. And it's not uh, mine, I changed some wording, but you find it throughout the literature. The first mention of it, I found in Frank Haidt's work. Uh, and I think that the cause of a crash is a circumstance or an action, which had it been different, the probability of such crashes to occur and those, their severity distribution would be different. So it's not the but for definition, it's a definition in the service of prevention. And if you agree that this is a reasonable definition of crash cause when prevention is the purpose, it has consequences, or its adoption has consequences. First consequence is that, cause, that causes are almost always many. And cause is something that A, could be different, and B, would affect the probability or severity of crashes to occur. And so for the 
Humboldt Bronco Cranes, not only Mr. Sid who the truck driver, or and his action was a cause, but also the pleasant intersection side distance is a cause, was a cause. As would be the prevailing regulation of track driver hours of work. As would be the frequency of stop sign, stop sign running. As would be the prevailing speed limits, 100 kilometers per hour on such rural two-lane roads, certainly un very unusual in Ontario. And every one of these four courses, and there are many others, indicate or give you clues to prevention. So the present intersection side distance, well, obviously removing the trees would be a prevention at that intersection. But prevention is not about treatment. Prevention is about future crashes. So once you recognize the trees in the army corner as a cause of such crashes, you might want to look at all rural intersections in Saskatchewan to see what the site distances are. And if they are deficient, then in, institute a program for removal of obstructions. That might be a prevention action. And should it happen that the truck driver was tired, then maybe a review of the legislation of prevailing hours of work and its enforcement and the technology of enforcement and so on and so forth. Every one of these causes can give you thoughts about what might be prevention actions. And that is the purpose of investigating causes. No other purpose. <clears throat> There's a series of consequences from adopting the suggested definition. And I'm afraid, as Stan is very quiet, they didn't, didn't tell me that I'm running out of time. So I will try to, try to wrap up uh, uh, to, to leave indeed time for a question and answer period. No problem to continue for a while. It's very interesting. So, okay, so I, if it's not a problem, I think I will take another 10 minutes or so. Is that okay? That's fine. Okay, thank you. The second consequence is that crash causation studies look at what's there at the site. They don't look at what's missing it from the site. But what is absent is also a cause. Something being present and absent are two, side, two sides of the same coin. So for example, the, this uh, MHI engineering report said, well, it might have helped if there were transverse rumble strips at such intersections. The, it wasn't there at the armory corner, but its absence might be a cause. None of the colliding vehicles, neither the truck nor the bus, were equipped with any ADAS assistance, assistance systems. That, the absence of ADAS on trucks and, cusses, and buses carrying sports teams and many passengers is a cause. And there is nothing really revolutionary about me saying it. 
because if somebody was in a class, didn't bear a seat belt, was ejected and suffered a head injury, nobody would hesitate to say that the absence of wearing a seat belt is a cause in this case. <clears throat> so what is absent is also a cause. Unfortunately, what is absent is absent from all crash causation studies. Another difficulty severing the link between, between causes and prevention actions. <clears throat> Consequence three, norms do not determine cause. Change in probability or severity does. So the trees in the corner are a cause because they limited sight distance, because they prevented the truck driver seeing the bus and the bus driver seeing the truck. It is not because trees in the corner are against a certain engineering drawing in Saskatchewan Department of Highways specifying what the sight distance should be. It's not the norm that determines the cause. It's the fact that determines cause. Not wearing seatbelts is not a cause because it's illegal. It's a cause because it doesn't protect you. And so on and so forth. Stop. Running the stop sign is a cause because it, it uh, prevents the collision. It's not a cause because it's illegal. That is another weakness of the crash causation studies because every one of them said that something has to be abnormal for it to be a cause. <clears throat> I'm coming back to this notion of proximate. In crash causation, the function of the legal definition of proximate cause is, is taken by the notion of substandard. So all crash causation studies define crash cause by the but-for test and the factor must be substandard performance. So it must be a bold tire, or it must be an obscured stop sign. But I was just speaking to a consultant two days ago about saving 60 right angle crashes at an intersection per year just by adding a pair of stop signs, making a an, an intersection from two-way stop control to four-way stop control. So the absence of two, two stop signs was a cause, but it was not because it's substandard. There is no standard telling you that you must use four-way stops. <clears throat> and the final consequence is that the but for test concentrating as it does on the road user and what they did supports a style of road safety management which is road user oriented. Whereas the proposed definition focusing on a large set of causes, not exclusively on the road user, justifies the safe systems approach to road safety management. And so <clears throat> it's time for questions and answers. Just wanted to, to tell you that why I but I was talking about this morning here and this afternoon where you are is based on a paper in accident analysis and prevention. And uh, if you don't have 
access to the journal. You can go to ResearchGate, ask for the paper and I will mail it to you. So over to you guys. I think Alexei. Uh, yes, I'm trying to read the question because most of them popped up just the very last second. <laughs> Yeah, so we have a comment from Shalom Hackett about the German database GIDAS that uh, they collect data on the accident factors, looking not for legal cause, but focusing on possible measures of prevention, which kind of indication that this philosophy, what you've been talking about, is uh, getting more and more spread. <clears throat> thanks, thanks, Shalom. Uh, can Shalom hear me? I, I suppose he can, yes. Okay, thank you, Shalom. Uh, I'm not familiar with the database. It is not one that uh, I have uh, examined or studied or written about in the paper, but, but uh, it's very encouraging for me personally, I think, but for all of us to see that this approach to, uh, to crash causation study uh, is taking root. Mm -hmm. uh, then we have another question about the safe system approach, uh, whether uh, it, there are some Proof that it works, uh, and me being in, coming from Sweden, I can say yes, there are quite good proofs that it works. Uh, but also, uh, is it also only phenomena for high-income countries, or the same vision, the same thinking can be applied uh, outside the high-income countries? <clears throat> Uh, I, I thank you for, for, for this important question. And uh, perhaps I should begin by an excuse. Uh, believe each of us live and are circumscribed by our own realities. And therefore, my experience uh, is basically within high income countries. Uh, and it would be presumptuous on my part to, to give too much advice for a reality uh, with which I am not in close touch. But I would say in principle, the safe systems approach, its basic principles or pillars apply everywhere. It's not a matter of whether one has enough money to, to construct and operate uh, fancy transportation systems. It's more a question of using all the tools at your disposal for and base them on evidence rather than opinion. And so while the means at your disposal may be different, the principle uh, that it's actions on the vehicle and actions on the environment and actions on the legal system and actions on enforcement and so on together, that must be applied in the management of 
road safety. Uh, I think these are the basic principles of safe systems. While I think implementation of priorities really depends on means. If I may, miss, maybe another question. Do outcomes of in-depth studies are incorrect to your opinion? Um, it's difficult to, it's, it's difficult to speak about specific outcomes. Uh, I, I'm, I'm personally more familiar with the MHCS, uh, with the motor carrier study because I was personally involved in it. Uh, the, it was initiated by a request from Congress telling the executive branch, please prepare for us a plan of action for the safety of trucks in, in the USA. The final report, of course, went to Congress. And between the initiation and the final report, the study was conducted. It was somewhat of a, an, perhaps not embarrassing, but haphazard enterprise where the task of doing the study was given, but the questions that the study is supposed to answer were not formulated. So you begin collecting data and you don't know what the question is that you are supposed to answer. And so it was a scramble throughout the study trying to think about methods which would answer useful questions where the question was not posed at the outset. And therefore it is very difficult because the aim was not clearly formulated at the beginning, difficult to speak about outcomes. The outcome was this final report to Congress, which basically says the road users do it you know, focus on the road users. The, the only tangible, uh, tangible outcome that I know about was that they prepared this database, uh, which and contains all the findings, all the crash investigations, all the factors listed. So a researcher, if he, had a question that could be answered by this database, could use the database. And there were a few of these studies done, but I cannot really tell you first and from, from first and knowledge to what extent the, the, these were important questions, to what extent the database actually managed to answer them. I don't know. Uh, I would be very interested to hear from you or from Alexei or from anybody else, whether the Snacks project came up with some tangible, something that you would call tangible results. That's the, Europe, the European project, the safety net project. I, I went through, I think most of the reports and, uh, and I've seen some sub subsequent publications using that methodology, but I'm not in a position to assess the usefulness of the outcomes. Maybe Alexei, you know? No, I'm not that much familiar with that project. Sorry. Do you know Stain? 
microphone. Me neither, no. No. Okay. Um, maybe the final question, I see that we have to round up, but I found it very curious. Now everybody is talking about the whole traffic being replaced by autom autonomous vehicles. And some people claim that will solve all the safety problems, but we as safety researchers still believe that there would be accidents. And that is co uh, quite a kick to that paradigm of blaming road users. Who blame in this case? <clears throat> well, uh, I'm not sure that, that that's a question, but I can, by, but I can make a comment. <clears throat> I hear my my human factors colleagues talk a great deal about the unsolved problems surrounding automated vehicles. I think they feel that so far there always is an option for the road user to take over the driving function when there is some kind of problem or malfunction. And they seem to see this as a major problem. How can a person remain vigilant, not doing anything for hours, and then suddenly have to take over when the emergency arises. So <clears throat> this is certainly not an area of my expertise. I'm just conveying the hearsay that I, I, I'm, I'm uh, party of, uh, that there will be problems, there will be different problems and they will, as I am trying to claim, road user and vehicle and road and environment based and all and all causes could be should be considered. Okay, thank you. Um, I think the time has come to uh, to round up and to uh, to say thank you to uh, you, Ezra, if I may, uh, for your kind uh, willingness to, uh, to to share your insights uh, with uh, with so many people. I still think that the results are very meaningful today and uh, should be in the, the mind of anyone who is thinking about uh, concepts like cause and, and factors and, and really deriving conclusions based on accidents for, for future actions. So Thank you very much uh, for that. Thank you very much as well to the ones that were present today. We will be glad as ICTCT to, uh, to see you again for one of our future activities, uh, uh, either online or uh, live that will depend on, on circumstances. So wish you all a very nice uh, uh, Friday afternoon or morning wherever you are based and uh, see you back soon. Bye-bye. Thank you all. Thank you for your help. Thank the audience, the invisible audience. It's a strange experience. Bye. Bye, Ezra. <laughs>